Rent got too expensive, had to leave LA So I got into my car and I went away to the big estate Playing poker every day Going all in with these fish like I'm mad and all you can eat buffet All right, welcome back you guys. This is a fun video from Poker House Dallas, which as of right now is no more. Yes, they closed their doors. They're trying to appeal and get back open, but we're gonna revisit this session here I played a week ago. When I looked down at Pocket Kings, it's a 5-5-10 game. The 25 and $50 straddles are on from time to time. The $50 straddle is on in this moment, so I decided to raise it up to $250 straight out of the gate with King Kong, not a bad hand. Danny makes a pretty disciplined fold here with fours, and OFC, who has around 4K in his stack, he came to play. He wants to make the vlog, and uh, he puts in the call. I'm in the small blind, he's in the plus one straddle, and we go off to a flop. When you have pocket kings, you wanna hope for a board that does not come like this. Ace high, ace seven, six, rainbow, and the action's on me. I think I could be mixing here between betting and checking, but I decide to check considering there is an ace out there, and also, Checking will underplay my hand, I think, a ton. And OFC, he likes to take the bait sometimes and put more money in the middle. Shout out to you if you're watching. A really fun player in the Dallas area. I check and he snap checks behind, bringing in the seven of spades. Pairs the board, it brings a backdoor spade draw out there. And once again, I think I like both options here. Betting to go for value against some straight draws like eight, nine, and maybe some worse hands like five, six, pocket eights, pocket nines but also checking here because there is an ace out there and I think I'm only gonna get one street of value. So I decided to check it here once again and OFC decides to play this one super tricky and act uninterested in the pot by checking it back once again with the ace in his hand. The river now comes the five of clubs and his trickiness is gonna get rewarded. If you think you have the best hand in poker, you gotta bet it for the amount of value you think it's worth. I have pocket kings, he's checked it behind twice. How could he have an ace in the spot? So I'm gonna go small here and try to target any of the one pair type of hands. For instance, five, six, we now beat with uh, sevens and kings in our hand. And uh, we can also beat hands like eights, nines, tens, of course, jacks and queens, but I don't expect him to play this way with those hands. I'm gonna go really small here for $150 and he snap raises me pretty large. I don't know, my spidey senses are up. He could have an ace, of course, but let's think about it. He checked behind on the flop and turn. So I'm gonna put the money in here and uh, he's gonna have to show me the goods, which he does. Of course he has ace nine. His name is OFC. Of course he has the goods and he's gonna take down that 2K pot straight out of the gate. All right, only the 25 straddle is on in this hand and Sam decides to raise it up to $100 from the cutoff. Jonas is on the button and decides to call with a suited 7-6 of hearts, a pretty hand. I'm in the big blind and decide to put in the call as well. I could be three betting here, but uh, you can see that Sam was gonna be going absolutely nowhere. He might have even been four betting, so good thing I just call here. Let's see if we can win this hand post flop. The flop comes jack 9-7 with two clubs. It's not a bad board for us. We have a gutter to the straight, but there are two overcards and two clubs on board. And well, we have neither of those, no overcards and no club in our hand. I decide to start with a check and Sam is obviously gonna be checking here with ace king. The action gets checked through, bringing in the nine of diamonds on the turn. The action's on me once again. A little decision point for me, do I wanna bet into two players on this board when no one has showed interest? I think there's arguments to both sides. I decide to start with a check a little bit more passive here and see if I can get to a cheap showdown. Sam checks it again and Jonas is a good player from uh, Germany, I believe, and he decides to fire out here for $150. He just smells weakness and uh, I don't blame him. When Sam, the preflop raiser, checks twice, it's gonna be pretty hard for him to have a strong hand. However, I have underplayed my hand, I think, so I put in the call. I'm not gonna let him bully the table. And uh, let's see if Sam decides to come in as well with his two overcards. He does. He's looking to see an ace or king on the river. And of course it comes. The king of spades. The price was just too good for him to fold. The action's on me. Let's get to a shutdown. I start with a check. Sam checks it over to Jonas who checks behind knowing that he can't be good anymore. And just like that, Sam is taking down that pot. We are 0 for 2 on the night. All right, let's see if we can get something going here with 4-3 of hearts from the cutoff. What's that yellow dot next to my name? Well, it's called the knit game. If you guys are familiar with the stand-up game, it's exactly the same as that, except you don't have to do the worst part of the whole thing, which is standing up for 30, 40, 50 minutes. For those of you who have never heard of this game, basically everyone starts with a button in front of them. That red button that I have a Pikachu on top of right there, 
Yep, that's my button, and once you win a hand, you get rid of it. The last person to have the knit button in front of them owes the whole table a bounty. In this case, it is $50 per person, so it's pretty expensive, $400 if you lose this, and uh, I don't have any intentions of doing that. It's still early on, but I decide to open it up with 4-3 of hearts from the cutoff. Denny Mark is in the big blind, and he's going to 3-bet me, and uh, he makes it $400, a pretty large sizing. When the action's back around to me, I could be folding. I just have 4 high, but I'll be in position, and I doubt Danny's going to put me on a hand like 4-3. So if the board comes low, we can bluff into him or just uh, smash the flop. Let's see what the flop brings in. I put in the call, and the flop comes 8-7-5 with two clubs, and Danny checks it over to me. I expect him to check here with a lot of his over pairs and a lot of his ace, king, king, queen type of hands. So I shouldn't just be blindly betting into him. That being said, I do have some things here. I have a gutter to the straight. Any six would give me the bottom end of that. So I decide to put more money in the middle. If he folds, I can just throw my uh, knit button in the middle and I'm off the hook for the rest of this game. $250 is the price that I decide to bet and the action's back over to Danny. He has some ideas. He has two overcards, a backdoor diamond draw and a backdoor straight draw. So he puts in the call. I don't blame him one bit. We are going off to the turn, which comes the king of spades. Interesting card. Now Danny checks for a second time. I say interesting because the king of spades is definitely going to connect way better with Danny. But uh, we're both thinking players. So if I bet out here, he has to know that I know he has more kings in his range. So that should weight me towards more hands like 6-4. Four, pocket eights, pocket sevens, pocket fives, eight, seven. Where I don't really think he's going to have a lot of those hands when he three bets me out of the big blind. And the action's back over to me. I could be checking behind knowing the king of spades is a better card for Danny. But instead, like I said, there are a lot of other hands that I can have more combinations of than him. So when you have more of the board, you should be betting into the $1,300 pot goes a hefty bet of $700 with four high. Come on, Danny, fold your cards here. I really want to get this one through and finally win a hand on the session. And additionally, I can turn over my 4-3 and get rid of my knit button. So it'd be a double whammy. Danny thinks about it for a while and ultimately finds the fold, which is great news for us. Little side note, he told me he was thinking about going for a raise in this spot. He just didn't think that I had much of it. But in the end, he makes a great fold in my eyes, and uh, we are going to win that $2,000 pot. But better yet, can't say I'm a nit. The nit game button goes into the middle. Get that away from me. All right, we look down at pocket eights for the second time tonight. Let's see if I can finally win with them. I'm in the plus one position and open it up to $75. And JD is in the hijack, and he three bets me to 225. OFC has a suited ace. He's never folding. He also has that knit button in front of him. So he's got to put in the call here. He does. And uh, I decide to call as well. Seeing the hand that JD three bet me with here and OFC called, I should be mixing in some four bets into my range, knowing that uh, JD is three betting me with ace jack suited. It's a good hand, but uh, seeing this hand, I definitely could be four betting and getting both these hands to fold, thereby taking down like $450. Instead, though, I just call. I'm not exactly sure what JD and OFC have in the moment. And we are going three ways to a flop, which comes king, nine, ten with two diamonds. Going to be pretty hard for me to win this one, even though I have 33% equity. JD has a gutter to the straight. He also has the nut flush draw. And OFC has a backdoor flush draw. So even though I have fourth pair, which is good in the moment, uh, it's not good when the action checks through and the turn comes the 10 of diamonds. Action's on me once again, and I'm going to check. Nothing for me to do. The board is super, super wet. Let's see if JD decides to put money in the middle now that he has made essentially the nuts. I know the board is paired, but uh, look at it. He has 90% of the board locked up, and he bets out for $250. We both get out of the way, and I am 0 for 2 with pocket 8s on the night. The snowman are no good for me. It's too hot in Texas. And uh, yeah, they melt. We lose another hand. All right, fun hand here. JD opens it up from the hijack to $150. The $50 straddles on, so that's why he made it $150. OFC puts in the call from the dealer button with Jack-9 offsuit. Premium hand for him. And uh, we find ourselves in the plus one slash straddle position, and I decide to defend and put in the call. I could be three betting here. In fact, I should be three betting. I'm not exactly sure why I just decided to call here. I think I can do it a small percentage of the time, but uh, yeah, the majority of the time, I just want to make this like 600 bucks and take it down or go heads up to a flop. Still, we see a pretty good flop for us when it comes queen eight five with two diamonds, and I start with a check. The preflop razor JD checks it over to OFC. It's a pretty good board for him. He's going to have all the 5-8, queen-8, queen-5, pocket-5s type of hands. And he knows that and bets out for $200. 
When the action's back over to me, I have top pair with a great kicker. I put in the call and let's see if JD calls with a lot of his back doors. He does. He's a good player, puts in the 200 bucks, and just like that, we are off to a turn in this $1,100 pot. I check it once again over to JD, checks it over to OFC. He has a gutter to the 10, that would give him a straight. Don't tell him that, he's gonna fire out once again pretty large here for $550, and the action's on me. Now I'm never folding in this spot, I have top pair with a very good kicker. I'm really just thinking about if I can be raising and what value hands I would be targeting. I think a raise here would be a pretty good play. Six, seven would be a hand that JD or OFC could have. They could have nine, 10, 10 jack, two diamonds, stuff like that. So yeah, raising here definitely could get some value from worse hands. Instead, I just put in the call and I'm gonna let OFC blast off on the river if the diamond draw breaks off. Which it does, it's pretty much the best card in the deck. A board pairing four of clubs. We're now beating hands like eight, five specifically. Not gonna be betting out into him once again in case he has a hand like fives or eights. So I check it over to OFC, trying to keep those bluffs in. And he tosses out one Pikachu with two green chips. For all you non-Dallas players, a Pikachu is a yellow $1,000 chip. And yeah, he tosses out $1,050. So nearly half pot size bet. The pot has ballooned up to 32.45. And I have top pair, I gotta be putting in the call. Ultimately, that's what I decided to do, putting in the money. And just like that, OFC turns over a jack high busted draw and we are taking down that $4,300 pot. Let's freaking go. Quick side note, if any of you guys are interested in playing online with me, I have a fun, safe, and a friendly environment that I've been playing in five times a week. That link is down in the description below. I'm on there three to four times grinding in the one, two, and two, five streets. So yeah, if any guys wanna play, there's also 25 cent, 50, and 50 cent a dollar. You can play in every state except for Minnesota and North Dakota. That link is down below. I'm on there three to four times a week. Come catch me on the felt and let's get back into the video. All right, this is an interesting hand here. OFC raises it up to $200 and he has a hand that did not pick up on the card reader, so we're not gonna know what it is. At this point, we decided to play the knit game once again. Everyone has the buttons in front of them. The action's over to Walker, who looks down at ace-king offsuit from the small blind. He comes in for a very large three bet, all the way up to $1,000 in the actions over to me. Now I like Walker, he's an awesome guy, but he hasn't been playing too many hands. Maybe it's card distribution that's affecting him in this exact session. But yeah, he hasn't been playing too many hands. I know the knit game is on, but uh, I don't really play too differently when the knit game's on. He's a pretty solid player, and I know that his three betting range is going to be a lot of ace-king, king-queen, of course, queens, kings, and aces. Jacks are unlikely because I'm holding them. So against that entire range, I'm not exactly doing too well. And if he's playing tighter in this session because it's a 5, 10, 25, 50, I think uh, you can take a lot of those hands out like king, queen offsuit, maybe even ace, queen offsuit wouldn't decide to three bet that large here. So if it's really just aces, kings, and queens, and then the ace, king suited and unsuited, it's a pretty bad spot for me. So ultimately, this is what I decide to do. <laughs> it won't get looking at the camera. <laughs> oh my god, that's the funniest thing I've seen in my entire life. Yep, I fold and look at the camera. I'm looking at the camera for two reasons. One, I think that I have the worst hand and I want to show everyone that I'm making a good fold, which in the moment I was flipping against Walker, but you know, he's probably going to get there anyways. And two, I just wanted to be funny, man. Just looking at the camera, who does that? And uh, yeah, shout out to Eddie, the announcer here at Poker House Dallas for picking that up and seeing it in the moment. It's always fun to kind of play with the announcers at the table because it is a 15 minute delay. I know he was gonna see that later on. All right, we folded Jax to Ace King. We now pick up Ace King offsuit for ourselves. We see an open from Jonas from the plus one position up to $100. And of course, I'm going to three bet him to $350 with the beautiful Ace King offsuit. Let's see if we get any action. Jonas does not, he folds. We show our hand getting rid of the knit button. But yeah, sometimes the sessions are like this. A lot of three bet and folding, or you pick up pocket eights a bunch of times and you lose them. That's just the nature of the beast. You can't get caught up in all the YouTube hype where every session is a winning session. No, we are doing good in this session, don't get me wrong, but you see like that, you pick up Ace King, you three bet, gotta include it for the vlog. I'll let you guys know that I don't only play two, $3,000 pots with Ace King offsuit. All right, this next hand, we pick up King Queen offsuit from the plus one position. And after I raise it to $75, JD puts in a standard three bet to 225 with uh, Ace 10 of diamonds, a pretty great hand. When the action folds back around to me, I'll be out of position. It's king-queen offsuit. It's kind of a borderline call or fold. 
I decided to fold. So throwing this one in there as well, showing you guys there's a lot of decisions here where I uh, could have gone either way. But yeah, I decided to fold here. I was at an equity disadvantage. He's gonna have the better hand here with his ace high versus my king high. But yeah, just gotta pick your spots in these poker games. You uh, wanna put the money in sometimes. You also wanna zig and zag. This time I decided to zag. Shout out to JD, he's gonna take this one down. All right, Sam opens it up here from the plus two position with pocket threes and Walker puts in the call with the suited ace. I have a suited ace as well. His is a little bit better because he can make some wheel straight draws. But uh, yeah, I have a six of hearts and put in the call. And JD from the big blind, the sneaky player, decides to three bet it up to $400. Let's see if uh, anybody puts in the call, giving me some pot odds. Yes, in fact, Sam decides to put in the call. Walker gets out of the way with ace five. He could be four betting here. It's a pretty good candidate to do so because he blocks pocket aces. But he decides to fold. I'm not going to fold. Uh, the nick game is not on, but don't call me a nit. I put in the call here for an additional 325. And we are going off three ways to a flop. Put two sixes out there, dealer. That'd be pretty sweet. He puts one out, but the other two are the exact same suit, and it's six, eight, five with two clubs. Pretty gross board. I would have loved to seen it all hearts. Instead, JD's the only one with a club. The action checks over to me. Could I have the best hand? In fact, I do. I have a pair of sixes, but I decided to check behind on the flop, leading us off to the turn, which comes a red 10 of hearts. When the action checks over to me for a second time, I really think about it long and hard here. I'm debating betting out and trying to protect my hand, but I think JD's gonna have a strong club in his hand. I don't think he's gonna fold too often. For instance, if I bet out here for $500, JD's probably gonna float me with his two overcards and a club in his hand. So ultimately, I decided to check, hoping not to see a king, queen, jack, or a club. And maybe we can win this $1,300 pot. The board pairs, which should be good, except it's the 10 of clubs. Now anybody with a club now beats my pair of sixes. And uh, yeah, I'm expecting JD to bet out here because he does in fact have a club. And that's what he does, $425 into the middle. It's around one third the size of the pot. And I think about it for around 30 seconds, seeing if I have a hand that could call a bluff. But even though JD is a good player and he could have some bluffs in this spot, it's uh, unlikely given the fact there's two other players in the hand and anyone could have a club in it. So yeah, I ultimately decide that my six is no good and I let JD have another pot. And uh, yeah, back to back hands, we are losing. Sometimes that's just the nature of the beast. All right, pocket eights for the third time here. Of course, we got to win it, right? Third time's the charm. Walker puts in the call for 25 bucks. Action's on me. And uh, we all have the knit button in front of us. Once again, we are playing it for a third time. I've won it the last two times, meaning I'm up 100 bucks. But uh, yeah, one bad game and we would be down $400. So I decided to come in for a raise and I raise it up to $200 straight out of the gate. Going large, if everyone folds, I just win the knit game. And that'd be pretty sweet. So 200 bucks is the price to put in the call. And uh, JD has his button and puts in the call with ace jack offsuit. You can see he doesn't want to three bet me here because he doesn't want to face a four bet with a pretty weak hand like ace jack. So I got to be picking up on these types of things in real time. And Walker decides to put in the call for 175. I said third time's the charm and the flop comes 10, eight, four, bang, we flop middle set. Actually, I was just pulling your leg. The flop comes four, three, deuce, rainbow. Because uh, you know, sometimes the sessions are like that. You're not gonna flop an eight. However, double-edged sword, no eight, but we do have an overpair. Until you look at Walker's cards and he has pocket threes, so we are in a world of hurt. Oh man, Walker smooth checks it over to me. And uh, in between two opponents, I usually start with a check. But given how dry this board is, and I know someone's going to have an ace here, I want to protect against a five, giving them a wheel. So I actually decide to bet out into the field. There's 645 in the middle, and I make it $175 to go. Just like I said, I know someone has a jack, and JD does. He puts in the call with his wheel draw and two overcards. The action's back over to Walker. Now you saw I made a pretty big fold against him when I had pocket jacks and he had ace king. Let's see if he puts a ton of money in here and goes for a check raise after a bet and a call from JD. Sure enough, he tosses in a Pikachu and announces raise. That's $1,000 to go. And even though we do have an overpair, which I do like, I don't really think he has many bluffs in this spot. He's going to have five, six. He's going to have all the sets and uh, two pairs, probably not for Walker, but he has a very, very narrow range. Even ace five is a wheel. So yeah, I don't really find any bluffs that he's doing this with here unless he has pocket fives for an open-ended straight draw. But that's ambitious given a bet and a call. So at the end of the day, pocket eights are just a bluff catcher and I don't want to see two more bets. He's sizing up and he's trying to get his entire stack in. 
I'm not going to let him. I make a pretty disciplined fold. And JD does as well, but good thing for us, he's going to have to show his cards if he wants to get rid of that nip button. And uh, I see that I made a pretty good fold. All right, we still have our nip button in front of us. It's down to a few players, and I'm not trying to lose $400. So when I have king deuce of clubs on the dealer button, I decide to come in for a raise over the $25 straddle. Then I make it $100. The action's back over to OFC, and he decides to defend his $25 straddle with a call. And we see a pretty good flop for us when it comes King-10-3 with two spades. OFC checks it over to me. I'm going to go for a standard C-bet. And he can't continue even though he has a backdoor spade draw. I turn over the cards, and just like that, we are going to take down another nit game. And that will bring us into the last hand of the night, which is by far the best hand I might have ever played on Poker House Live. If you guys have made it this far and have not already liked the video, please be sure to do that and also hit that subscribe button. A ton of WSOP content is coming your way and I don't want you to miss out on any of it. So yeah, make sure you hit that subscribe button and now let's get into the hand of the night. We look down at pocket queens from the plus two position. There's a straddle on and a limp, so I decide to make it $125. Let's not forget the knit game is still on and Danny Marks, our good buddy here from Dallas, decides to come in for the three bet with king queen offsuit with the knit button in front of him. The action folds back around to me and I think this is a mix between four betting and calling. The arguments for four betting would be Danny has a wider than normal range with the knit button in front of him and another point would be the fact that if I just call I would be out of position the rest of the hand so I think four betting is probably the better play in the long run that being said I have to put some strong hands into my calling range here I can't just be calling with pocket seven sixes fives and uh, then four betting with aces kings and queens so I decide just to call here and we are going off to a $700 pot out of position which of course comes king high king 10 six rainbow one thing I want to point out once again is uh, poker vlogs sometimes skew the perception of the viewer to think that every hand is an interesting one. And uh, you can see I have pocket queens on a king high board. I have jacks against ace king. There's some spots that are just kind of mundane and play themselves out. And uh, yeah, a lot of folding and three betting pre-flop. So yeah, not every hand in poker vlogs is going to be an exciting one, but uh, I have a feeling this hand is going to get pretty interesting on the turn in river. When the flop comes king high. I decide to start with a check. The action's on Danny with a pair of kings, and he decides to go for a standard 25 to 33% pot size bet. And uh, I have pocket queens. I can't be folding just yet. I don't love my life considering I have second pair, but got to be putting it in for a cheap price. That's what I decide to do, bringing in the turn which comes the nine of clubs. I check it over to Danny for a second time, and he decides to bet out now for $500 into the $1,100 pot. When the action's back over to me, I could be folding. That's a very reasonable play. Calling, uh, it's kind of getting borderline now, and there is a third option of going for a check raise. Now, if we're thinking about all the options, I like folding and I like raising. Why do I like raising? Well, I think Danny's going to have a lot of hands exactly like he has. Ace, king, king, queen, king, jack. Now, if you think about the hands that I have, I'm going to have pocket tens, pocket sixes, pocket nines. And yeah, pocket tens would play exactly like this. They would check call the flop, and then they would go for a check raise on the turn, trying to pile more money in. So yeah, if you're going to be a balanced player and you're going to be tricky to play against, you got to throw some weird hands in there where after the fact, if Danny looked at this footage, he's going to be like, how did uh, Wolfgang show up with queens in this spot? How did he get that bluff through? Yeah, so at this point, I'm going for the check raise as a bluff. I'm going to turn my queens into a bluff here and try to get him to fold a weak king. Additionally, I can get him to fold hands like ace-jack, ace-queen, maybe a hand like ace-five of diamonds, ace-five of spades, stuff like that. Just cleaning up a lot of equity, trying to take this pot down and move on to the next one. I go for a check raise to $1,500. It's a large one. If you're playing a big game like 5-5, five, five, 10, 25, 50, the check raises on the turn are going to get pretty gnarly and you got to fasten your seatbelt. You got to put your big boy pants on and sometimes you just got to go for it. And that's what I decided to do. If you guys have been watching this vlog for the last three years, I started off at Agua Caliente in Palm Springs, California, playing the 1-3 game with $2 chips. The three bets would be to $12, $15. Now look at us. We are playing huge stack poker out in Dallas. And yeah, it's pretty surreal to see how far we've come. We're going for the check raise here to $1,500. Danny has a pair of kings and he puts in the call. I think it's a pretty easy call from him. But my intention was not just to get the hand over with on the turn. I knew there's a chance he could call with any king. 
So I got to follow through on the river. Hopefully it's a good one. And it comes the nine of hearts. I think it's an interesting card because it makes pocket nines a little bit less likely. Another hand I could have had on the turn is queen jack suited because that made the nut straight. But with a board pairing nine, would I want to go large on the river when it pairs and I have a straight? Maybe I go half pot or two thirds. But at the same time, I'm representing two types of hands, pocket tens, pocket sixes, so that's a full house. And then I'm also representing queen jack suited. Not exactly sure what all of my bluffs would be in this spot, but I don't think he's gonna put me on pocket queens trying to get a king to fold. But that's what makes you tricky. Sometimes you gotta go for it. There's $4,000 in the middle. I'm gonna fight for it. I know I'm not good in this spot, and I'm putting him on exactly the type of hand he has, ace king, king queen, or king jack. The first and third are a lot more likely because I have two queens in my hand. I think I can get both of those hands to fold. If I go for a large bet, 4,100 in the middle, I wanna see a bet size of at least $3,000. Nice bet for me, I decided to size up here to $3,025. He's grabbing a ton of chips and putting it over the line. And Danny immediately says he wish he didn't bet the turn, which is definitely what I wanna hear. I know he has a king and I'm hoping he can find the fold. This would be an awesome bluff. Honestly, this is the biggest bluff I've ever tried to pull off let alone in a big, big game like this. So yeah, regardless of what happens in this hand, pretty stoked on the way I played it. And just having the cojones to go for it here in the $7,000 pot. A little bit of thinking, Danny decides to put in the call, which is devastating for us. We're gonna have to turn over the losing hand, pocket queens, and we see he did in fact have king, queen offsuit. He later told me that the queen was instrumental in putting in the call because it blocked hands like queen jack. He said if he had ace king, he would have folded. So why can't he have ace king one time? That's definitely a hand that could be in his range. He would have folded there and we would have got it through and looked like a boss. But really interested to know down in the comments what you guys think of this bluff. Do you like me going for it in this spot? Do you wish I would have just folded on the turn when he bet out for $500 and not went for the check raise? But yeah, sometimes you gotta draw the line in the sand. I tried to go for it here against Danny Marks. I know he's a thinking player. Like you said, he would have folded ace king here. So if I can get him to fold that, there's a chance he would have folded king queen, king jack. Even the announcers said uh, they're folding this spot and they're putting me on pocket tens. That was one of the hands I was trying to represent. At the end of the day, I'm losing this massive pot to end off this session, giving back all of my profits that I worked so hard for in this five hour session. But uh, you know, that's how it goes sometimes. Poker isn't all glamorous. If I would have won this one, I would have been up heaps. But instead, we are stuck on the session and we rack up our chips and head over to the cage. When it's all said and done, we got in for 3K, we topped up an additional 4K, we cashed out for 2180, so a net loss of 4820 in around four and a half hours. Not the best session I've ever played, but pretty happy with how I picked my spots, folding jacks, and uh, running that bluff against Danny Marks. Let me know down below what you guys thought of that, and uh, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace!